This week on CrossFeed. Daddy Jesus and Little Jesus. Was David historical? Jesus for Halloween. Don't take away my Jesus. And priests go under the microscope. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. I'm Pastor Jim Butler out in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Good to have you all with us today. Yep. So we're um, recording this on our Sunday night, which is our alternate recording night, and uh, I'm kind of glad we are, because I had a really cool weekend. Uh, on Saturday... Uh, we had a, a representative from our district come down, and he did a witness workshop and talked about um, how to share your faith with people. And it was really cool. He had a lot of really good insights, and um, we had a uh, handful of people from our church and a couple uh, people from a couple different uh, you know, neighboring churches to us, and um, it had a really good time. It, it was really insightful. So... And, uh, and then last night my daughter was in a play and we went to see that. And, uh, today I, it was my turn to, at the local, uh, home for the, uh, uh, developmentally disabled. Uh, it was my turn. I'm, there's a rotation with all the area pastors, uh, to go and do the service there. So I went and did that. So I had kind of a busy weekend, but it's been a really good one. Really enjoyable. So. Good. My weekend, eh, had a busy week, but uh, it, it's a week. What can I tell you? It's over now. Tomorrow starts a new one. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, we'll, where should we begin tonight? Gandalf, my old friend, this will be a night to remember. Well, I've got, the first story I've got sitting here is the statue story. Okay, it's coming. There's the statue. So that's cool. what it looks like. It's kind of, so, I have to apologize, uh, just because of our sort of low bandwidth problems, it looks kind of blocky from this end. So. Oh, looks really good at this end. Even you look good at this end. <laughs> anyway, there's a, a guy in Muncie, Indiana, and uh, he is um, trying to keep his statue of Jesus. It's a four-foot-tall light statue outside his patio door. And um, Spotlight, that it has got on there, casts a large shadow um, on the apartment, on, on the wall of the apartment complex. And the manager removed it because he said there is a potential violation of federal fair housing laws um, because the display could be an affront to the religious beliefs of other residents. He's also concerned that the apartment overlooks a polling site, which, <laughs> given that some polling sites are at churches, I think we can dismiss that one as a concern. All right. Uh, okay. Now, I can see if the spotlight bothers people. If mm-hmm. it's bright light, you know, it shines in my window. But he doesn't complain about the brightness of the light. It's the shadow. Yeah. Well, because they tried what to take... What it t- says. You know, the yeah. shadow well, being cast. T- even, even after they took down the uh, the light, they tried to take down the statue, too. And I don't get it. If it's a, mm-hmm. on this guy's patio, it's his place. And he can decorate it however he wants, as long as it's not... You know, obviously, there's like obscenity laws and, and things like that where, you know, he couldn't put up something that would be offensive to everyone. But if it's a, you know, this is his religious belief and and this is the way that he expresses his faith, I, I think that, you know, he's completely within his rights. He's absolutely within his rights. This is one of those those fun cases where they've done something, where I often sit there and go, why are you doing this? This is really stupid to do. 
because there's, you know, if, if they want to make a big deal out of it, <laughs> there's plenty of these, you know, church state freedom, um, foundations out there. I mean, I imagine even the ACLU would get on this one mm-hmm. and say, look, cause there's just, there's, just, he's not being offensive. He's not breaking any laws. There's no reason in the world you should be taking this away from him. It's his patio. <laughs> right. And, and law is, I mean, you're, you're the renter, yes. But the, um, you know, unless you're being, you know, causing trouble, it's considered, you know, just like a private dwelling. Inside your home, your place, it is your place. Right. So, you know, like what's next? Somebody's going to hang up some plants and it's the wrong kind of plant and it's going to offend some druids? I mean... (laughs) I mean, you know, (laughs) religious freedom is just that. It's religious freedom. I mean, if somebody wanted to have a pentacle hanging out there, okay, I may find that offensive. You know, I, I love it. This, you know, it may, you know, people may find an affront to this. Well, yes, they may. They may have find an affront to a lot of things. We may have find an affront to the, the apartment manager. Mm-hmm. Get over it. Yeah. Relax, Leo. Relax. You know, there are things in life that are going to offend you, but they're still legal. Yeah. No, the manager says, we appreciate the diversity of our complex. I will not participate in anything that's not open to everyone of every race, creed, color, and religion. We don't have political signs or anything religious that might be construed to violate the protected classes. All right. Um, the whole protected classes thing. All right. You probably know what I think about protected classes. All right. I think all people should be treated equally. Um, but, you know, you talk about diversity. All right. Well, apparently diversity does <laughs> not include Christianity. You know, okay, so we need to get rid of everything that that could possibly offend anyone. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. Well, uh, what I want to know is how is this offending the protected classes? Considering that, you know, uh, uh, how many, you know, uh, uh, blacks are part of a church? Uh-huh. You know, I mean, well, you're dealing with, you know, that, that just makes no sense. You know, um, uh, you know, I mean, Proposition 8, you know, was passed in California. Ironically, it got its biggest support from the black population who also voted for Obama. <laughs> so, you know, it was, you know, I mean, it was, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, think about this. So obviously, I don't think too many black people are going to, black folks are going to be, you know, Offended by, you know, this Jesus statue. I, <clears throat> I'm not trying to think who would be offended by a Jesus statue. Yeah, most Hispanics are Catholic. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't, I don't I mean, know. Um, homosexuals? No. That's about it. Now, yeah, I mean, uh, even, even I know... If, Several gay people who would not be offended by a Jesus statue, maybe offended by a few Christians, but they wouldn't be offended by a Jesus statue of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, well, you know that's that's the truth. I, I know lots of um, lots of gay people that um, that really have no problem with Christianity per se, um, <laughs> or 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 you know a lot of them may have a problem with Christianity, but don't have a problem with Jesus, mostly because they don't really understand what Jesus was about. But um, right. yeah, I. I, just you know, I, I think this guy next should you know start putting up political signs in his windows and. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that would. Yeah, I just want you mean to tell me in a population in, in a place that with protected classes, which you know strikes me, you know, just just now somebody has to correct me if I'm wrong. Podcast at crossfeednews dot com. I mean, a lot of times protected classes wind up being minorities, and the biggest minority is the black population. Although the Hispanic population is rapidly overtaking them. But you, you correct me. Podcast at CrossFeedNews.com. Tell me if I'm, I'm, I'm screwed up here. I may be. But don't tell me in that group there weren't a few Obama signs hanging here and there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most of the, uh, what we call protected classes or what, not what I'd call, but, um, you know, 
or probably voted Democrat. So yeah. So what? <sighs> he's his term. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, I'm sure that there were some Obama signs sitting around. What, what, so what so, if you what if you got your car parked in your driveway and you've got a political bumper sticker on your car? You gonna right. come and rip that off the car? <sighs> this is just you know this is just a classic it's, case of people not understanding what religious freedom is and and just actually taking away religious freedom in the name of religious freedom. So, or actually, in this case, taking away free expression. Mm -hmm. Because there's, you know, certainly nothing wrong with the political signs. You know, yeah. and if if I can't, you know, I mean, I did not vote for Barack Obama. I could not support him. Let me be honest. I know a lot of people who did. And, you know, more power to them. You know, I'm glad you did. A couple of them, I even told them, congratulations, you know. Your guy won, you know, and, uh, you know, I, you know, that doesn't necessarily bother me at all, you know. I mean, I disagree with him, but, you know, it was a good campaign. He, he, he outdid the job. Simple as that. Um, to agree, you know, you know, where, but I'm not going to sit there and, you know, but to, 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 to yell, to scream, to teach, to just be respectfully. Come on, life's too short. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, isn't maybe, maybe fact, somebody needs to send the guy the link of uh, of uh, fifty two love forty eight, or is, is that what it is? The a what? Or is it? Yeah, yeah. The but, a what? Uh, there's, there's, there's a website. It's called fifty two loves forty eight, and it's from the majority, the fifty two who voted in favor of Obama, to the forty eight to who lost. Oh, <laughs> you know, oh. you know. 52, you know, dear 48, we still like you. We really do. Love 52. <laughs> I know. So, well, you know what he really might be offended by then is a Jesus Halloween costume. That's right. Which, amazingly enough, oh, it. <laughs> uh, there it is. It's the same colors. Here's the same here's the kid in the outfit. It's the same the same red sash. <laughs> All right. So this is in uh, New Jersey. I have a little boy in uh, Paramus. Uh, anybody in New Jersey, correct me if I misspelled that. Um, his name is Alex Winsky, and he's an eighth grader at Westbrook Middle School. And um, it was Friday. It was Halloween, and he wore a costume to school. Well, um, he already has shoulder-length brown hair, and so he put on a white robe and a red sash and sandals and a fake beard and a crown of thorns. And they sent him home. You're still here? Go home. Go. He was told he could keep the costume on if he removed the beard and the crown of thorns. He declined. Right. Now, uh, you know, he said a lot of friends um, often said he looked like Jesus. So that's part of it. Um, went with it. Now, um, th this is one of those, though, okay, because a lot of right, – by the way, it, what's interesting to me is the, the kid's Jewish. Well, he's he's Jewish, but his mom's Catholic. But, he, yeah, he just had his bar right. mitzvah. Right. So, um, which would mean actually he was a proselyte Jew because the rule of Judaism is that the the religion comes through the mother. Um, but anyway, um, you know, uh, the principal said he did not think he's overreacting. Um, said that the class, the costume had class stopping qualities. Um, children are asking, where's the boy who's Jesus? It was inter interrupting the classes. Um, so he says it was the, um, you know, the the, um, um, the the distracting nature, which was, you know, bothering the class, rather than the religious nature of the costume. I guess if it was, you know, really causing a disruption, 
I mean, if, if he came dressed that way and they didn't send him home right away and it was, you know, he was there for a while and, and finally they said, all right, you know, this is getting out of hand. You're going to have to take that off, you know? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, being a classroom teacher, um, you know, sometimes and, 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 uh, at one time, third to eighth grade teaching religion every day. Um, but, you know, you do need to keep control of the classroom. And if this was being disruptive to the classroom, I can understand it. And I can see how a costume like this would be disruptive. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, I can, I can, I can, you know, picture that. Um, you know, I don't know. I wonder if any of the kids were offended. It, 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 it's one of those things. I mean, I read the first story and, uh, off from Fox News. And I was like, eh, this looks stupid. And um, then I read the it's, uh, it's called the Gothamist, and that's where I got the picture from as well. And you know, that's where they talked about the principal, and he said, you know, this is getting distracting in the classroom. I'm like, hmm, that's another issue. How? Because freedom of expression is one thing, provided that it doesn't, you know, cause a riot, doesn't, you know, in a, in a classroom setting that doesn't distract from what needs to take place there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if this is stopping the guys from checking out the girls during homeroom, then there is definitely a problem here. Yeah, I mean, yeah well, this is this is the same thing with schools that have dress codes, you know, and one of the big reasons for dress codes is, um, you know, because it doesn't really get rid of the whole class distinctions, you know. You're still going to have your popular snobs and your... Um, you know, and your nerds and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, what dress codes do is they eliminate all these questions about what's appropriate to wear, what's not appropriate to wear, where's the line. I mean, I remember when I was in high school, we got this new assistant principal and she came down really hard on dress code. And, and basically we had never really, as far as I know, had a written dress code before that. And, uh, so she comes in and basically, there was some girls that were wearing skirts that you could see their undergarments. And, um, and she just said, no, that's, that's not appropriate. And, um, and basically she said, look, this is distracting. You know, this is, it's really hard for people to concentrate when there's people dressed like this. And, you know, Gail's one of them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This, uh, this assistant principal liked me. At one point, uh, we got locked out of the, the French room and, um, <laughs> and so the French teacher sent me down to the office to uh, get the assistant principal with the keys and the assistant principal almost handed me the keys to just go and unlock it. Like it would be the keys to the whole school and everything in it. And she goes, well, you're probably the one person in the school that I could trust to hand the keys to, but I better not. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, yeah, but he was being distracted. We, we know where this was going, Dale. We really do. Um, but interesting enough, she said if he took off the beard and if he took off the crown of thorns, he could have stayed in the costume. You know, now that was, now I don't know, to me that's a reasonable compromise. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and I mean, uh, uh, um, which, you know, and it says, uh, she had to, uh, take her son, uh, leave work, take her son home so he could shower. I guess, I guess, cause, I don't know, maybe he had spirit come on to keep the beard on. They returned to school later, but, uh, I mean, I, at the end of this Gothamist article, it says, um, uh, uh, there's a Brooklyn, Leonard, Leon M. Goldstein, or Goldstein High School, um, had a guy, they, uh, kid dressed up as Hitler one year. And, uh, that caused a ruckus. Obviously, at school with a name like Leonard Gold, but that name, it's probably a lot of Jewish population. Uh, yeah. Um, and so they just banned Halloween costumes. Now, I'm going to tell you something. As a teacher, I would simply ban costumes in classes. Yeah. That to me is just yeah. a recipe for causing trouble. Well, especially given the fact that um, most of the costumes that you find in stores are, even for little kids, are either really ghoulish or else 
they look like they should really be adult costumes. Um, kind of thing that you would purchase for your spouse, you know? I mean, in other words, they're really slutty. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, for little <laughs> kids, you know, I mean, I had a really hard time finding costumes for my kids this year. And, you know, something that was really appropriate. Well, my nine, my eighteen year old daughter had a heck of a time because uh, did she she wanted a costume. One of her friends was having a party, and she's just like everything is really slutty. You know, I was just that was just what it came down to. She says, "What is this? The one night girls can go out and get away look, looking like a slut, and get away with it." I mean, she was just really upset because yeah. you know it just a lot of it was just trashy. Well, my my kids finally went out as um, as Supergirl um, and Hermione Granger. So they were both covered. <laughs> well, Supergirl's got a pretty short skirt, but this this costume wasn't too bad. Mm. My kids, uh, I'm trying to think. My, my kids were always very unusual. One year, my son went out as a mailbox. <laughs> I mean, you know, the big blue ones, he took a box and he formed it and you and so you pull open the slot and put the the candy in the slot, the mail slot, and it went down to the backpack. Cool. Uh, one year my daughter cool. dressed one year my daughter dressed up as a table. <laughs> now she had a great big piece of you know heavy duty cardboard and then she glued an old tablecloth on it and then she glued um uh, a uh, you know paper plates and flatware to it. And then put her head through the center and put flowers in her hair, and she was the centerpiece. <laughs> well, my favorite is still um, somebody I heard about that their church was was doing this sort of anti-Halloween party, and you know, come to the church instead of going trick or treating, and come dressed up as your favorite Bible character. And so there was this couple that was kind of really into Halloween, and so they were kind of annoyed by the whole anti-Halloween thing. So one came as John the Baptist. After he was decapitated, and the other one came as um, as Lazarus, right after, right when he came out of the tomb. <laughs> so a mummy. <laughs> so. so no, we always had we always had the one of the rules we always had was that kids couldn't be anything ghoulish. We didn't like that. Yeah, same here. So, uh, In fact, go. this is the first year that I actually. Um, I, I generally have a no witches rule too, um, and I kind of bent it this year because Hermione is a character from a good book, and and I couldn't find anything else. So I finally said, "All right, fine." So, but she didn't wear a pointy hat though. Witches. I like the. I mean, we had a a, a thing at our church, and a lot of the girl, girls came as witches, and that doesn't bother me. I mean, we have real ones in Salem. None of them look like that. So, none of them wear the pony hats. Um, let's go talk about Little Jesus. Okay. Oh, you got a picture, huh? I got a picture. I got better than a picture. I can read you part of the book. <laughs> cool. All right, well, let's introduce oh, it first. Is... Yeah. All right, we've got... Um, uh, who's the author? Janet Carr oh, here is go. her yeah. name. And um, so here, here's the introduction. You ever wonder if Jesus had a family? What kind of father would he be? What kind of child would he have? Not many of us has, have given this much thought since we know that Jesus died on the cross, and general opinion is that he never had children. But children most certainly have thought about how Jesus is as a father and what his child is like. Mine haven't. Um, <laughs> so, Janet Carr delivers a fascinating tale about Jesus and his son, Little Jesus, that which parents can share with their children. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. All right. All right. You got an excerpt? Go ahead and read the excerpt. Oh, gosh. Okay, this is from the beginning, okay? And uh, so I'll read you the first two or three pages, the first chapter. I watched as my wife struggling to give birth to our son. I am thinking of his name. I say his name because during my meditation, my father spoke to me and said I was to have a son. He told me to teach him to continue the teachings of my father. As Mary Magdalene is laboring, she calls out my name. She asks me to promise her that if she does not make it, 
I will call our son Little Jesus. During her labor, she said my father came to her bedside and told her she was going home. My father told her that her work was finished and when she gives birth to Little Jesus. Little Jesus is his name. He de- oh, Little Jesus is the name he decided on for our son. Oh, good grief. Only a few hours went by before my dear Mary gave birth to our son and said goodbye to me. Before she went to my father, she whispered something to my son that was kept a secret until little Jesus was a bit older. The midwife stayed with me until little Jesus was stable enough to walk and talk. At that time, I started taking him with me while going to continue my father's work. He did not, at that time, ask what I was doing or show any interest in the things I was teaching. Little Jesus would follow me when I would go to the backyard to my special place. The special place is where I would go to meditate and talk to my father. He would stay behind me thinking I did not notice he was around. Day by day, I would find him at my side when I would open my eyes in meditation. I never knew how long he was there or even knew what I was doing. I would find him with his eyes closed, and after opening my eyes, he would open his and smile at me. I would get the feeling he heard the conversation between my father and myself, but no words were spoken of that effect between my son and I. One night, my son got very sick while he was asleep. In my mind, I could hear him calling to me. He was five years old now, and catching on to many things he had never been taught. It was just as if he knew. I ran into his room and found him fast asleep, but he was running a fever. I knew he had been unconscious while communicating with me a few minutes earlier. I placed my hand on his forehead and raised my head to my father and asked him to give me the answer to what to do. Was this a sign he was going to leave and be with his mother? Or was this a sign for me to stay home and not go out and teach for a while? I got no response. I sat with little Jesus until morning. There was no improvement. Again, I meditated to my father and asked him why I can't help heal my own son. Again, I got no response. All day, I kept going into my son's room to try to bring him to consciousness, but to no avail. Was I too emotional to be of any help? Must I remove myself from the picture to do my father's healing? How can I place my hand on a stranger and see the miracle, and yet not see the same in my own son? These questions were puzzling to me as I laid back to rest. Thus, this now begins the story of little Jesus. Wow, that's abysmal. (laughs) (laughs) I... You know, um, I mean, just the, the, the just this, 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 this thing from Market Watch, which is a, you know, publisher's press release. Yeah. You know, little Jesus, a smart and quiet boy like his father, travels to another time in his sleep. He befriends a boy named Andrew, whom he helps relieve his aching feet. Little Jesus creates a stir among the children, some of whom come, to, coming to him for help with ailments. Others make it appeal to be healed and just. Soon children are stoning him for being a fraud. Jesus couldn't understand why the children are being this way. He's yet to learn about the nature of man and of his mission in the world. Hey, man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. You notice that we have, you know, even if, uh, even if Jesus actually did marry Mary Magdalene, we have her dying before he does. Even though, according to the Bible, uh, well, that's part of the story. I mean, he, he couldn't because, see, m- my thing is, why can't he heal her? I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I would think he would just, you know, Mary, get up. He did it before, you know, did it like, you know, with her, her, her brother there, you know, you know, the guy, you know, the, the guy in the Halloween costume. No, yeah. no, no, no. That yeah, was my, that was Mary uh, Bethany. This is oh, Mary that's your match, right? Yeah, but, just, but he you know, held, he cast out. seven yeah. demons out of Mary Magdalene. That's right. So I mean, I just, I mean, I'm reading this just going. Um, I mean, I, I love the how they describe the authors. You know, uh, um, you know, uh, she would, you know, uh, clean rooms and daydream and go and tell other girls the stories. And she found that when she told stories, she had the undivided attention of her listeners. I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. Boy, I'll tell you what. Um, if I had stories like that, I'd be forgetting a lot, too. 
<laughs> and I would sit there and be, I, my tension would be completely undivided. Man, is this really as bad as I think it is? <laughs> it's, it's like those, uh, it, it's like when you, when you go past a crash scene and you just have to slow down and, and see <laughs> how bad it really is. Right. <laughs> um, this, by the way, it's published by a company called Ex Libris. They're a vanity press. In other words, she couldn't actually get a publisher to pick up this book. No. It's, it's self-published. It's a vanity press is what it is. So, uh, wow. This, I mean, you know, we, we could sit here and, and pick it apart and show, you know, like, the whole thing with Jesus not understanding what's going on and stuff when he's God, you know, and, but Jesus being able to, he- unable to heal when he's God. Yeah. And this whole, like, you know, kind of, I don't know, just the whole Jesus going, I don't get it. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm seriously wondering if she's Mormon because, you know, you think about this would make perfect Mormon theology sense. Jesus is not fully God. Jesus is only God's son. Uh, he, or, or maybe, you know, I mean, it could be Arianism being taught here too. But I, but as I thought of, you know, he's married, uh, he's working his way to, to earning the right to be fully, to be God. Um, so I was really wondering if, um, she, she might be, you know, have a Mormon influence or something like that. You're right. That could be. No. I it don't know. Could... Wow, because yeah, maybe somebody else has another idea. Podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Give us your thoughts. You know, do you think she? You know, what where you, what kind of influence do you think she might have? Because there's nothing in the press release about um, about her religious uh, anything. Um, no. You know, her whole the whole thing is about what a good storyteller she thinks she is. Um, but there's nothing actually about her um, what her personal beliefs are. Now, you know, um, I don't know, maybe I'll send you this. Did you notice now at the bottom of the link? You know, just, uh, uh, the bottom of the link, it says you could get a complimentary review copy. I, I think you should send for it and read it and give us a review on CrossFeed News. I think I've already reviewed it. <laughs> 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 you, know, you know, when we did... Um, you mean that first chapter was enough? <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't need to read anymore, you know? Um, you know, we we read the, the, the Mecha Manga Bible Heroes thing. That was cool, you know? That was worth reading, and that was worth sharing. Yeah, there you go. And we did... I did post right the, here. the um, press release from the issue number two. It's also about David. Um, I'm not going to, you know, spend a... Uh, podcast time talking about it right now, but um, but yeah, see, that's actually something that's worth reading. This is wow, this is really abysmal. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's the, word you use. The, the the um, the, the Gnostic Gospels actually have more substance to them than this, and more, you know, and probably more, um, probably better Christology. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't saying a whole lot. No, it isn't. But uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah. The, as a matter of fact, at the head of their um, Ex Libris's um, website, it says Ex Libris Book Publishing Company, book self publisher, print on demand. Write your own success. Sure, and there's a lot of companies out there, and, you know, they're great if you want to just try something out and, you know, kind of see how it goes, and you know that no publisher would ever pick it up, but... I mean, it worked for the guy who, the kid who wrote Aragon, but, uh, you know, it's not going to work for too many people, Uh, and definitely not her, (laughs) so... Wow. Well, let's go from the ridiculous to something really cool, um... And I don't know, you can't really, hopefully you can see that behind me. Hopefully our, our bandwidth issues have cleared up here a little bit. Um, this is really neat. It's what they think it might be. It's possibly the oldest Hebrew inscription found. Can't really see the inscription. I love it the just looks like somebody's giving us the finger. Possibly Hebrew inscription possibly found. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, but possibly twice in the headline. Like, we're really not sure. <laughs> We're really not uh, going to go out on a limb here. So, yeah, this was, uh, it was found at a hilltop south of Jerusalem. Um, it's a ceramic shard found in the ruins of an ancient town. And it has, um, well, it has this, this inscription that's maybe Hebrew or maybe not. Um, they're saying it could be, what are they calling it? Proto Canaanite. Um, and so just, you know, most of these old inscriptions and things like that that they find, generally they date them based on a combination of where they find it and the, uh, if there's enough there, they can do it based on the dialect because there's a lot of different languages, um, around that area that all use basically the same alphabet. And um, basically, they it's they have the same um, words, but they use different grammar, so the words are just slightly different. And um, what we don't always realize is that the Hebrew that we're used to seeing, um, that you and I learned in seminary, I mean, in, in yeah, college, and, and worked with in seminary, and we work in you know our B- Biblia Hebraica Jugartensia. Uh, is actually based on Aramaic. That did not exist in um, Israel until after the fall of Jerusalem in, five, in, in uh, 586. That's when that that form of writing came into influence, and, and they kind of just re- restructured all the letters, Hebrew letters, into that. There's this much more ancient form of writing that they, they does show up every now and then. It's one of the ways you know it's, it's very old, because... It's this older style of Hebrew. Uh, the other thing is they used carbon fourteen dating and uh, of the other of it and stuff around it. And it says this would go back to what is uh, you know would be the um, golden age of David's uh, rule, one thousand to nine seventy five BC. Yeah. So, you know, there's every reason to think that this is Hebrew, um, but the problem is that there's people that say no, David never existed. Or, you know, or else it was just some, like, little local tribe and it wasn't, um, you know, it's sort of like, oh, he, David, yeah, it's sort of like King Arthur, you know. Yeah, he may have actually existed, but not the way that the stories say. Well, but there's really no reason to think that that wasn't the case. Uh, this really, this reminded me of a, um, there was a piece of pottery that also dates back to around that time that was discovered they actually said David on it, um, and they. But because the um, the the vowels were not even invented until the Masoretes did in what was it, two hundred A.D. something like 1, that. One thousand. Thousand eight was it that recent? Okay. Um, and so, oh yeah, I guess I knew that. And. So, you, you know, you've got this word and without context, and there was very little context, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what is this actual word? And they're saying, you know, and it could be David, um, DVD, right? Um, or it could be dude. Or, yeah, it could be dude, which is, that's my contention. They were just really cool because they're saying that it was dode, which it could also be. And, um, and Dode, uh, they're saying was some like fertility god or something like that. Even though there's no mention of any Dode in any other ancient writings or, or anything like that. But they just like made it up. Like, well, it can't possibly be David. So it must be some god that we've never heard of before. <laughs> I mean, um, it, it is strange that for all the mention and the importance of David in the Bible, there is no um, mention of him outside the Bible that we've found yet. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, we got to realize, I mean, how much stuff is not around. Right. I, I mean, you know, it, there's just, we're not used to thinking this way. You know, we're not used to thinking, you know, things not existing at all anymore. And, uh, 
and, and huge amounts of knowledge, you know, in the dust. You know, and, and you've got to dig pretty deep to get down through all the layers to get down to David and the boys. Right. Well, you, you know, know, I mean, the thing to understand <laughs> is that, um, you, you know, most of the knowledge that we have of ancient history comes from like one document that was discovered somewhere or, you know, or some pottery or something like that. that and there's only one copy of existence. If they hadn't found that one copy, you know, we wouldn't know anything about you know, uh, it could possibly entire civilizations. And, um, you know, so all of a sudden they find this one thing and, and all of a sudden it changes history as we know it. So, you know, we've got the Bible is this ancient text. And, and for some reason it's the only ancient text that gets dismissed as being not historical. Right. Well, the other side of this, this, this whole thing too is, um, I, well, I mean, not only do some things exist just on the basis of one text, but there's things we don't even know. Uh, I don't, you, you were, um, you, you missed, I think, the Ebla craze that, you know, was at the seminaries when I was there. But it was that, you know, we had, we had some guys who came and helped dig it up, but it was an entire city that nobody knew existed. It's not mentioned anywhere. Uh, but there was a, a tell. They thought uh, that, that you know might be something there, and they you know dug it up and yeah, and they found this uh, library. You know, they found the loyal. A lot of the stone tablets were, were smashed, but a lot of them were in good shape. Um, a lot of them, you'd be surprised, were tax bills. Uh, <laughs> government hasn't changed, but it was just you know it was an amazing find, and. Um, but there was nothing, you know, so, but there was nothing in any other record that the city ever existed. So here's the question. Since it's not mentioned anyplace else, did the city really exist? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, no, I've, I've heard of the Ebla tablets. But, right. yeah, the, the whole sort of excitement predates me. So, but, I mean, here's, that's, that's just, the, in here we have the same thing. Okay, so we can't find a mention of David outside. That doesn't mean he didn't exist. Um, and the one, you know, one document that, yeah, there is a, abundant proof, you know, later on we have, um, what's his name? Uh, Yehu. The guy who drove crazy, uh, drove the chariot mad and, uh, uh, his, um, bowing down before, again, the Bible talks about, it, uh, the kingdom being uh, uh, taken over by Assyria during his reign, he became a vassal of Assyria. Uh, and there's a you know black obelisk that has a picture of Yehu. They call him Yehu, son of Omri. Although technically, according to the Bible, he was not a blood a blood son, but Omri was the last really powerful king. So anybody would have been the son of Omri, probably the Assyrians were concerned. But it shows him paying tribute to the Assyrian king. Okay, well, here outside, you know, we got evidence that this king existed. Right. And a whole bunch of other stuff, too. I mean, you know, there's there's been so much stuff discovered that points to the historicity of, of these various stories. Why why is it that, well, we accept that this guy existed, this guy did, and, you know, the stories about these people are pretty historic. Then we get to David, and, oh, well, no, that couldn't be. I mean, until, what was it, two years ago, the Pool of Siloam was dug up? Mm -hmm. You know, nothing sat under, you know, 10 feet of mud before that. You know, nobody, it was right there. But, you know, don't tell me the Pool of Siloam doesn't exist. It did. They just tweeted it nowhere. So there's just, you know, it's it's silly of them to say David probably didn't exist. Um, and then there's an issue of interpretation published by Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, about David and you know, they, they were, you know, they said, you know, he probably did exist, although we do acknowledge he's not mentioned outside the Bible. Um, but the idea that he's, you know, as this guy say, he's just a, a myth like Paul Bunyan, but maybe a shred of a fact. Oh, come on, please. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like this, this, this guy's name, this archaeologist, Yossi Garfinkel. <laughs> Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. Uh, 
I love it. I think it's a great name. But he really needs to just, you know, go out with, uh, join Paul Simon. Simon <laughs> Simon <and> Garfinkel. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, <clears throat> you're not, this is once again, though, this is a perfect example of something that we as, as Christians and, and probably Jews would also look at this, um, at least Orthodox Jews. And, um, and, and they would say, yeah, well, you know, here it is. Here's more evidence that, that the Bible is historically, historically accurate. All right. And then there's other people that are going to come along and say, no, we're going to interpret it differently. You know, we're going to look at the same evidence and we're going to look at it completely differently. And we're going to say, no, you know, this doesn't prove anything. You know, and we've looked at other archaeological finds on this show and, and talked mm -hmm. about how, you know, we look at it and go, oh, look, you know, here's proof. There was, it wasn't too long ago that we talked about that, um, that thing that they found where it was written in ink on stone and it was talking about the Messiah. Um, what was it? Dying and rising again or something like that. And, and, oh yeah, Jesus just ripped off this idea or, or, you know, the, or the, the gospel writers ripped off the idea or something like that. Like, no, this just shows that this is all historically accurate. And, you know, but it, it just goes to show that, that if people don't want to believe, they'll reinterpret the evidence. You know, so when you have people that say, well, you know, if God is real, why doesn't he just say, hey, I'm God, you know, he's like, well, for one, he did. He became flesh and, you know, he performed all kinds of miracles, even raised himself from the dead to prove it. And people still didn't believe, you know, and um, and then, uh, you know, for that matter, if if that happened, all of a sudden this voice boomed out of the sky, there would be you know, oh, mass hallucination or, you know, um, they'd come up with all kinds of strange weather patterns, you know, or they, they'd they explain it away. So... It does, the description, by the way, doesn't say David on it, but it did come out what looks to be a very large settlement, which, and, you know, the dating of the time, which would show them, you know, this is what they the theory that this guy has is this is a fortification against the Philistines during David's time. But more digging things. But to your comment there, uh, way back in the 1970s, you know, when you were probably crawling on the floor, uh, there is this show uh, some people might remember called On Search Of. Oh, yeah. And Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy, yep. Uh, and anyhow, they had one that was On Search Of Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching it one time. And at the end of it, I just thought it was amazing. Um, he says, uh, he says, uh, Ultimately, though, you know, nothing can be proven. Uh, they said, if no, I can't remember exactly how I put it, but I remember it was the gist was, if Noah's Ark were to be found tomorrow, the believers would say, we told you so, and the non-believers would say, I still don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I thought, man, that's pretty insightful. <laughs> yeah. So, um. There's a great song. No wonder I like Mr. Spock. Um. It was written by uh, Jonathan Colton, and um, and it's called Under the Pines, and it's about uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy's uh, In Search of episode with Bigfoot, and uh, and in the story they sort of go off together. <laughs> I don't want to go this down this road. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> maybe it brings up to our last story. <laughs> oh wow, you're right. That's a lot of, a really bad transition. <laughs> that was unintentional. Ah, the song's free, by the way. JonathanColton.com. You can find it there. Okay. Yeah, under the pines. Okay. <laughs> maybe Leonard Nimoy needs to be a Catholic priest. Uh, I don't know, but. Uh... <laughs> Basically, it is. Um... And, 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 and Pope Benedict has approved this guideline and his pictures at the, the, the article. That's why we have his picture up there. But the, the Roman Catholic Church has issued guidance for future priests to have psychological tests to weed out those unable to control their sexual urges. Um, they think the screening would help avoid tragic situations caused by what they term to be psychological defects. Um, also, it vet those with deep-seated homosexual uh, tendencies. 
And uh, uncertain sexual identity, excessive rigidity of character, and strong affective dependencies. And also it would deal with uh, heterosexual urges as well. Yep. But basically it is to see if in, in this uh, the candidate ha- would have difficulty living celibate. So this makes sense. And now, makes a heck of a lot of sense. We have not. I when there's news stories about um, all these scandals, and there have been, you know, thousands, um, well, hundreds anyway. I don't post them up to CrossFeed. Um, we don't talk about them on the show. The reason being that everybody's heard it, and there's really no new news. It just keeps happening over and over, and. And, you know, half of them are just alleged and, you know, half the time the guy that's being accused has been dead for 10 years. And so he can't, you know, he can't even tell his alibi. And so they just settled it out of court and, you know, and, and there's people that, (laughs) there's people that I know that have, um, that have said, oh yeah, this person is claiming this priest did this. And I know this person, this person will do anything to make a quick buck. And, uh, I don't believe him. You know, and so a lot of that kind of stuff happens too, and so. But but I, I was interesting reading this article. Says that an, a seminary in Austria was shut down in August two thousand and four after revelations that students openly indulged in homosexual conduct. Yeah, well, you know, you've heard uh, the stories, and you know, I I don't know. Uh, I mean, obviously, clearly, this one is true. You know, you've heard other stories about. Catholic seminaries and stuff, and I tend not to be a rumor chaser, um, so I tend to just sort of ignore those stories because I, you know, can't verify them. Um, well, I mean, that homosexuality would be prevalent in a, you know, set of clergy that cannot marry would be a logical thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, it just, just would be. Not necessarily that all are um, at the jail up here. That I go to every now and then. Uh, the Catholic priest was engaged at one point, uh, but uh, for some reason that just didn't work, you know, work out. And uh, he kind of, you know, fell into the the the, the ministry. Um, one of one of the most interesting guys I've ever met in my life. He, this guy, he keeps. I, I just looked at him and I said, "This can't all be real that you've done in life." He's like, "God's giving me a lot of green lights." <laughs> like, man, you got to write a book. You gotta write a biog- autobiography because your story is just fascinating. I mean, I just love listening to him. Uh, but I mean, he's told me though. There's, you know, uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Henry Newen, uh, was a celibate homosexual. Um, and that only came out after he died. But um, it, w- it was made public after he died. But a lot of his good close friends knew it. But as long as he remained celibate, right? You know. That I'm not gonna, you know, worry about it. Uh, that's the question, and I think the question in, in here is not, are they straight or gay or whatever else, but within the Roman Catholic context, can they remain celibate and without being a burden to them? Right, and you know that was Saint Paul talks about you should get married to avoid sin. You know, right. if and and he actually now you know this whole question of celibacy. All right. You know, he actually does, St. Paul talks about that, um, and he seems to be speaking specifically for those in the ministry, that, um, you know, if you can stay celibate, great. You know, he says, would that everyone were like me, um, because he was, and, um, you know, and if you can, great, because, you know, well, then you can focus more on the ministry, all right? Um, but it, at the same time, he also says that, a uh, um, p- uh, pastor uh, must be a husband of one wife, you know, and and ironically, the first pope, uh, according to the Roman Church, Peter, is the one apostle that we know was married for a fact, mm-hmm. because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Well, you can't have a mother-in-law unless you're married. All right, and Peter talks about Peter, I, and Paul talks about Peter taking a wife. Mm-hmm. So can't we all have mm-hmm. a wife like Cephas does? Um, I, I mean, talking to, 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 to Father Bob at the jail, um, I mean, you know, sometimes I'll talk about things and I'll go, you know, yeah, I can see how it, it's easier 
you know, you're not burdened with some of the, you know, some of the family issues. You're not burdened with wife issues. You're not burdened with, you know, a lot of things that guys get burdened with being married. I mean, you know, um, having said that, I told him, I said, but, you know, yeah, you can, you can, you can work 24 seven. That's why a lot of these guys, a lot of these priests are still, you know, doing priest work at 90 years old if they can. They have nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. You know, who mm-hmm. wants to sit around and, you know, be bored, you know, stay built. But I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, uh, uh, all things being equal, I'd rather be married. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because otherwise, man, you burn out, you know, or I don't know. I, I guess I'm biased. <laughs> I'm just being married and being happily married. Um, I just, you know, I can't imagine, I can't imagine doing this without my wife. Cause while I don't share confidential things with her, you know, if I've had a rough day, um, I can come home and, and kind of unload. Um, or, or for that matter, you know, if something really great happens, I have someone to tell. You know, I have a great experience, I have a neat visit or something like that. And like I said, I don't share confidential stuff with her and she doesn't want to know, you know, but, um, but if I, you know, if I go and I have a great visit or something like that and I come home and say, Hey, you know, I had a really great visit or it went really well and, you know, I'm really happy and I want to tell somebody and, you know, she's always there to tell. And, um, Mm -hmm. so, but, you know, at the same time, my biggest, um, I guess stress is the word. Uh, in ministry is juggling family and the ministry, you know, because we don't punch a clock. It's not like 40 hours a week or anything. Um, you know, there's always that there's all, cause there's in the ministry, there's always more to do. And, you know, you, you never clear off your to-do list completely. Uh, and so it's always, I like, just don't start one. <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've got a half a dozen books that I've basically, the entire book is in my head. I just haven't actually written it down, you know, and, uh, none of them are about little Jesus though. <laughs> Ex libre <express. laughs> But, uh, you know, and I don't have time to do that because, you know, for one, I've got a family, but for two, I've got other hobbies too, you know, and, um, you know, podcasting, but, <laughs> but there's, you know, this is where you start going for the sabbatical and the grant. Yeah. So, uh, but I think overall, um, I think it. I mean, uh, did they still have the psychological testing when you were in seminary? Yeah. 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 I mean, they did for us too. Um, I thought it was a good thing to go through. Um, and uh, probably it wouldn't be a bad idea to do more. You know, Minnesota multiphasic, um, and a couple other uh, disc inventory would be a good thing. I mean, there's a lot of good inventories out there. I think we did the disc one. Myers Briggs. Familiar. I know we did Myers Briggs. But you know, to help you understand. But and then, oh gosh, cause I, because I mean, you don't know sometimes what you're going to wind up with. Wind up with in seminary. Um, when I was there, they had a student who was setting off the fire alarms every night. Oh, jeez. In the dormitory. He was taking uh, a bottle, a, a can of aerosol, and he'd spray it up at the, uh, you know, the little cones that they had there. It would cut off the oxygen, and, you know, then, you know, so the alarm would go off, everybody would have to leave, the, the fire trucks would come in. Yeah, everybody had to leave the dorm. They had to go through the dorm and check everything out, make sure there was no fire. And this went on night after uh, this first year I was married. This was my second year there, and it was it was constant. Um, and then one day, um, I saw all these police cars and saw them. Uh, some guy with his head covered up in handcuffs. Never had a problem after that. Huh. Well, you know, but yeah. I mean, you know, so they need this kind of stuff to to protect the people. Mm-hmm. And I hate to say that, but that's what it comes down to. It comes to protecting the people, protecting the church. Now, I have one question uh, about this. These are voluntary tests. So if someone has these tendencies and they're somewhat aware of them, are they going to submit to these tests if they're voluntary? I mean... 
at the, you, you sort of, on the one hand, you kind of wonder, like, okay, why does he not want to submit to the test? But at the same time, then you, you can kind of turn into the sort of, um, you know, if, if the person's just a big privacy advocate, you know, I know a lot of people that would not want to submit to any kind of testing, you know, like this, not because they have any sort of tendencies or anything, but just because they value their privacy and they're afraid that, you know, that something's going to get misconstrued. You know, I've, I've taken personality tests, got all done with it. And, and these were like sort of self-administered tests. Um, and, and I, I get all done with it and it's sort of, you get this little, like, here's a description of who you are. And it reads like a, um, like your, what do you call it? Your horoscope deal, you know? Um, and, uh, and I read the description. And I'm like, no, nah, that really doesn't describe me at all. I, I'm not like well, that. I would say this about it. It's probably voluntary as long, you know, yes, it's voluntary. You can consent to taking it whether or not you want to. <laughs> but we can also consent whether or not we're going to let you in the seminary or consent whether or not we're going to let you in the ministry. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, now it's perfectly voluntary just as long as you want to follow the rules. I know. It it, it does seem like a good idea, though. Mm-hmm. For and that's just... kind of everything for tonight. But maybe you have another opinion. Maybe you think, yeah, this is a violation of privacy, should not be allowed. Podcast at crossfadenews.com. Yep. Give us your opinion. Yep. Give us your thoughts. Um, we did, by the way, get noticed on a blog uh, that I thought was kind of cool. Uh, and uh, that uh, she's listing all sorts of uh, different places to look for different kinds of information and things. And, and uh, she and noted ours. Well, she, she's talking well, about if you're, like, starting a business or, you know, you want to get your information out, that this is a place where you can post it. So... Um, yeah, that's true. And we've had, you know, there have been people that have, um, have posted, uh, information about their missions or, you know, or something like that as a news story. Um, you know, you want to post your press releases up like that? Hey, go for it. You know, <laughs> Hey, we talked about what one or two press releases tonight, you know, <laughs> especially if it's really wacky, like little Jesus, you know? <laughs> we'll probably talk about it, <laughs> but not everything we talk about is wacky. <laughs> So, and if you're watching this in, uh, at the YouTube or Rever or one of those places, you know, feel free to leave a comment and we'll get those too. So we appreciate those. Or you can, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, CrossFeed News. And I said this last time, I'll say it again. Uh, if you are one of our listeners and you follow us and you follow me on Twitter, just send me a note and let me know because nobody has yet. Um, but I've got quite a few people follow me. And, um, and so just leave me a note and, and let me know and I'll follow you back. So, cause I'd like to, like to get to know our listeners better. Just so out of interest to the people who follow you called twits. No, that's something else entirely. That's a different podcast. <laughs> just, a different podcast. Oh, okay. I just wondered, you know, if any other, you know, you know, follow on Twitter. I, I don't do Twitter. So I just little twits. Uh, anyway, um, on that note, hope you all have a very good week, um, and in God's grace as we head into the beautiful month of November, and uh, the Lord keep and watch over you. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.